الرحمن الرحيم I respect for the associate sorry I respect for the associate professor Dr Muhammad Azam Muadil Director General of the Institute of Islamic Understanding Malaysia IKIM the honorable Dr Ahmad Badri Abdullah Deputy Chief CEO Executive Officer International Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies IAIS Malaysia the esteemed professor Dr Dr Muhammad Fauzan Nordin director of the International Institute of Islamic Thought Triple IT East and South East Asia the respected guest speaker of today Dr Miles Davis president of Linfield University Oregon USA professors doctors Dato Dato Datin Datin government personnel ladies and gentlemen members of the floor assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and a very good morning to all welcome to today's special lecture on the importance of islamic values in the modern world before we begin our program let us raise our hands in dua recitation bismillahir rahmanir rahim الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا ولوالدي ورحمهما كما ربونا صغارا اللهم أحينا بالإيمان وأمنسنا بالإيمان وحشنا بالإيمان وأدخلنا الجنة مع الإيمان Praise be to Allah the Lord of the worlds peace and blessings be upon our prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions for those who followed his tutelage to the day of judgment on this blessed morning recording in progress today's special lecture we beseech for your grace and ask for your infinite blessing to us your humble servants we seek your mercy for the flawless progress of this event from the beginning to the end ya latif ya rahman please bless us with your tawfiq and hidayah please guide us to greatness peace glory and prosperity in this world and the hereafter rabbana hab lana min azwajina wa dhurriyyatina qurrata a'yun waj'alna lil muttaqin imama rabbana thank you for your cooperation in the dua recitation ladies and gentlemen in a rapidly changing era it is crucial to reflect on Islam's timeless wisdom and values that can guide us towards a more harmonious existence. Islamic values rooted in compassion, justice, equality, and integrity offer profound solutions to our social, economic, and environmental challenges. These values value emphasize empathy, fairness, inclusivity, and ethical conduct serving as a moral and ethical compass for individuals families societies and humanity by embracing islamic values we can foster unity compassion and justice and pave the way for a more enlightened and prosperous society in the modern world thank you to our co-organizers the international institute of advanced islamic studies iais malaysia the international institute of islamic thought triple it together with the institute of islamic understanding malaysia iqim for making this event a reality let us seize this opportunity to learn reflect and engage in meaningful discussions that can contribute to a more enlightened and harmonious society ladies and gentlemen to illuminate this event i would like to invite associate professor dr azam muhammad azil director general of the institute of islamic understanding ikim to deliver his welcoming speech please welcome
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala asyur musalin wa ala sahabat jemain. Uh, thank you Mr. Chairperson uh, Brother Muhaimind. Of the Board of Directors of Ice Malaysia, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I would like to take to take this opportunity to extend my heartiest appreciation to the International Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies IS Malaysia and the International Institute of Islamic Thought, Triple IT East and Southeast Asia for this meaningful collaboration. I would also like to welcome Dr. Miles K. Davis to Colombo and extend our greatest appreciation to you for being with us today. The topic that will be delivered has significant contribution to the understanding of the influential role and importance of Islamic values in providing solutions to the minds of the modern world today. It is our greatest hope that this lecture will add to our knowledge on the topic and also spur relevant problem-solving ideas that will benefit us all. Distinguished guest. Since its establishment in 1992, IKIM has continuously strived to provide the masses with the knowledge on Islam, either locally or on the wider global platforms. Through three of its academic centers, namely Center for Sharia, Law and Politics, Center for Science and Environmental Studies, and Center for Economics and Social Studies, IKIM organizes national and international programs on topics and issues relating to Islam that are pertinent and relevant to all segments of society. IKIM employs this and avenue to educate and inform the general public on the Islamic perspectives and the solution in Islamic traditions with regard to issues that are of grave concern to humanity and world civilization. IKIM researchers are also engaged in research works, publications, and writings which focus on the universal values and principles of Islam that are all encompassing and relevant to mankind. For this purpose, IKIM has recently established research, a research management unit that specifically focuses on coordinating ventures related to research and empowering their networking for a systematic research environment between. IKIM and other research institutions. Another important of IKIM is IKIM Radio, which is considered an effective medium of knowledge sharing that reaches out to almost 1.3 million listeners on a weekly basis. IKIM Radio can also be reached globally through the online radio platform, the social media, the social media such as IKIM Radio Facebook page and YouTube channel. And recently, we also joined through this Audio Plus as well as MyTV Mana Mana. The broadcasting of IKIM programs is coordinated by TV IKIM and Internet TV Production that produces knowledge-based contents for the benefits of our viewers and also followers. Ladies and gentlemen, Finally, let me take this opportunity to once again thank, thank Dr. Miles K. Davis for being with us today. I believe that your wisdom, knowledge, and expertise on the topic today will definitely benefit us all. I would also like to thank all participants who are here to listen to this important lecture. And on behalf of IKIM, I would like to extend our sincere appreciation to RAIS Malaysia and Triple IT East and Southeast Asia for this collaboration, and we look forward for more synergetic ventures. Thank you. Wabila Taufiq Walidaya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Associate Professor Dr. Azam, for the warm words. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of RAIS Malaysia, Dr. Ahmad Badir Abdullah, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Please welcome. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sh uh, Profesor Dr. Muhammad Azam Muhammad Adil, Director General of IKIM. Prof. Dr. Dr. Muhammad Fauzan Nurdin, Director of Triple IT East and Southeast Asia. Prof. Dr. Dr. Sa uh, Dr. Saadia Muhammad, uh, Member of uh, the BOD of IAIS Malaysia. Uh, Reverend Jonathan uh, Jesudas from the Council of Churches Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Maiske Davis, uh, our speaker today, and the president of Linfield University, and Mr. Shahram Kasim, the CEO of College Darul Hikmah, and our moderator today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this esteemed public lecture uh, on, the on the topic of the importance of uh, Islamic values in the modern world. Today, we have uh, the honor of hosting our distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Mais K. Davis, the president of the uh, Linfield University, renowned for his uh, expertise in the field of management entrepreneurship and their profound connection uh, to religion. Uh, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude uh, to the organizers of today's event, IKIM, uh, IIIT East and Southeast Asia, uh, for pro providing this platform and allowing IAI to measure the privilege of hosting this significant event. I think for this year, I think this is the second time we host uh, a speaker from uh, the United States. Uh, earlier this year, I think we, host, we hosted uh, Dr. Yaakob Mirza, I think the good friend of our speaker today uh, in this hall, uh, speaking about, uh, uh, about uh, religion and its uh, connection to uh, uh, entrepreneurship. IAI's measure uh, as an institution is committed to fostering a deep understanding of Islamic values. Uh, it is truly an honor to have the opportunity, opportunity to engage in this uh, enlightening discourse. In the modern age, uh, marked by a remar remarkable advancement financed by the Industrial Revolution, we found ourselves facing a profound challenges. Uh, one of them being the global climate change, the very system that have propelled us forward have it inadvertently led, led us to the critical environmental crisis we are experiencing today. This recognition highlights the urgency of our discussion on the importance of Islamic values in addressing the complexities of the modern world. Within this context, Dr. Miles K. Davis' expertise in management entrepreneurship and their relation to religion becomes even more pertinent. His insight will not only shed light on the intricate uh, interplay between these fields, but also provide us with a deeper understanding of how our action and decision driven by the forces of modernity have contributed to the current uh, global realities. So understanding the role of religious values, particularly those derived from Islam, in addressing this multifaceted uh, crisis of our time is of uh, utmost importance. So in conclusion, I would like uh, to express my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Mai K. Davis for accepting our invitation to share his profound insight on the interplay between modernity, particularly in relation to Islam. So his expertise with, um, we, uh, will undoubtedly shed light on the importance of ethical and sustainable practices in addressing the env environmental and economic challenges uh, stemming from the modern age. So to, to each and every one of you who are present here, I extend my sincere appreciation for joining us in this uh, enlightening journey this morning. I hope that today's discourse uh, will foster thought-provoking discussion and provide us with some valuable insights that can shape our collective efforts to create more just, inclusive, and sustainable future. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Badi, for your heartwarming speech. For the next agenda, I would like to invite Professor Datuk Dr. Muhammad Fauzan Nodin, the Director of Triple IT for East and Southeast Asia. Please welcome. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. 
Sum alhamdulillah. All praise to Allah SWT and salawat and salam to our Prophet Muhammad Sallam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, uh, Honorable Guest, Dr. Miles Davis, uh, President of Linfield University. Sorry, this part of the protocol and the procedure, we have three welcoming remarks, and because these are three different organizations organize it, but we are friends. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Shushu Professor Dr. Mu'azam, Director General of IKIM, Dr. Badri, Deputy CEO of IAIS, Prof. Um, Sahadia Muhammad, they call you Mr. Muhammad, Prof. Muhammad in the United States, uh, Member Board of Directors of uh, IAIS, Brother Shahran, the CEO of College Darul Hikmah, come uh, Deputy Director of Triple IT, East Southeast Asia, and uh, Reverend Jonathan. Thank you and my uh, the participant. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam Malaysia Madani. I think uh, we have to promote our prime ministers too. And so happened our prime minister is also a chairman of Triple IT E Service Asia. And I'm proud to share with you uh, our Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim is the only non Malay, uh, the founder of Triple IT, seven of them. One of them is uh, Professor Dr. Ismail Faruqi, passed away. Uh, second is uh, Dr. Jamal Bazanji, also passed away. Third one, uh, Dr. Tahajabil Alwani, also passed away. And the uh, fourth one is uh, Professor Dr. Hamid Abu Sulaiman, our former rector, also passed away. There are only three left. Uh, Dr. Isham Talib, based in the United States, our president now, President Triple IT. And Dr. Ahmad Tutunji, based in Turkey. Uh, and the only Malay and non-Arab is Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim. Uh, they established this uh, Itripati in 1980. So, Alhamdulillah. And I'm uh, glad that uh, Dr. Mao said uh, he engaged in, uh, uh, with Tripati in the United States. And uh, for us, Tripati is a uh, vision to integrate or to promote uh, Islamization and integration of knowledge. Without knowledge, we cannot do much, and especially the knowledge of ethics. Um, and, and with the development of AI, artificial intelligence, then the social media. And uh, recently, Professor Bart from uh, Leiden University, he came and interviewed me, and he went to Indonesia and Singapore, of course, Malaysia. He told, he published a paper saying that um, Islam has the solution for AI. And we can learn a lot from this region, from this Southeast Asia. And I'm glad that uh, Dr. Miles came here and shared with us the ethics, uh, the important Islamic values in the modern world. Sometimes you forget our ethics. Sometimes we even don't practice our ethics. And this is problem with uh, us as Muslims, not problem with Islam. And, and I still remember when uh, Pak Nasir, the former prime minister of Indonesia said, while we develop Indonesia, do not ruin the, the, the people, the Indonesia itself. And recently Tristan Harris said, while we developing the machines, we are uh, degrading the humanity. This is a, a former in Google's engineer. And he just wonder what is the ultimate reward for the people or in the social media. People and these uh, inventors of Google they, uh, and Facebook, they want to make people uh, happy. They come up with the like buttons. Unfortunately, when people did not get enough likes button for a day, they are depressed. So it is opposite. So people are searching for the solutions. And I'm proud and I'm uh, confident enough to say Islam has the solution. But we're not by saying that it's not enough. We have to do it. We have to do research. We have proof. We have to prove it. And uh, I, I here I write a paper on the how Surah Al-Hujurat, 18 verses, Surah Al-Hujurat, 
then we can take from 18, we can take 17 of that a lesson or Ibra, how are we going to deal with social media? Like Lita Arafu. We have to know each other. We have to know Reverend uh, uh, Davidson. How, how Jonathan, sorry. Uh, how we, we uh, others' uh, religions. And Lita Arafu is to know each other, not to hate each other. Uh, Allah uh, stated in Surah Al Hujurat that Allah decreed men and women different from different tribes, different kind of people, want to know each other. In Surah Al Hujurat, do not beg by thing. In Surah Al Hujurat, ask us to be justice. In Surah Al Hujurat, uh, uh, how to make uh, uh, adil or, or to promote happiness among us. So, this is 17 lesson. Now, from Mouse, I'm studying Suratul Namal, uh, Quran. How uh, in Suratul Namal, that Allah SWT uh, described how Prophet Sulaiman, and Prophet Sulaiman is Prophet of Christianity to Solomon, and Prophet of Judaism, Solomon and David, Daud. How they learn the language of birds. How Prophet Sulaiman learn, understand the, the, the language in ant. And, and how the uh, the bird food, food uh, travel and how uh, Prophet Sulaiman bring uh, the, 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 the throne of bounties and how the augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality is there during the Prophet Sulaiman Salam. So we have to study. So by saying that, I think we have to do a lot and we have to do it together. Tripathi alone cannot do alone. We have to do with IAIS. We have to do with EK. We have to do with Linfield University. Inshallah, we'll visit your universities soon, 2025, inshallah. I plan, I have to uh, collect some, have some fun first. Then inshallah, we have to do it together, uh, locally and internationally. By doing that, inshallah, we can prove Islam is the best solution for everybody. Islam is rahmat alamin. Islam is rahmah. It's not marah marah. Mara Mara, uh, Miles, uh, I don't know, you know Mara Mara. Rama is uh, Ramatul Rama Alamin, but Mara Mara is don't get angry and get not insult others. Wabillahi taufiq wa hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Datuk Dr. Fauzan, for the kind words. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now on to the agenda that you have been waiting for, the special lecture by Dr. Mike Davis on the importance of values, Islamic values in the modern world. This session will be moderated by Mr. Shahran Kasim, the Chief Executive Officer of College Darul Hikmah. With that, I would like to invite both the speaker and the moderator onto the stage. Please welcome. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Uh, we are indeed uh, grateful to have our honorable uh, guest today with us uh, to deliver a talk on the importance of Islamic values in the modern world. Dr. Miles K. Davis is the 20th president of Linfield University. He obtained his PhD in human and organizational sciences from George Washington University. President Davis is an authority on entrepreneurship whose most recent work focuses on integrity, values, and principle in the business world, as well as faith-based entrepreneurship. He helps organizations manage cultural and structural changes, strategic planning, leadership development, and strategic growth initiative. President Davis has won numerous awards, including awards of service from the NAACP and the Drum Major for Justice Award from the United Churches of Christ. He has also won recognition for his interface work from the Islamic Society of North America and the United Methodist Church. President Davis is much sought after speaker 
on the topic of organizational change, ethical, moral, and principal leadership, and the need to transform the higher education. We now invite our honorable guest, honorable speaker, President Davis, to deliver a lecture on the, Islam, the importance of Islamic values in the, in the modern world. You have 45 minutes, President. You know, uh, after listening to the three speakers before me, I don't know if I have anything else to say. I think that they've said it all. I, I will try to add a little bit more to it. This is this better? Okay. Um, it's interesting. As we listen to the conversations about all that is changing in the world, as we listen to rapid technological advancements, as I spend time riding through Kuala Lumpur and watch buildings that reach up to the sky and go into places where I'm greeted with holographic images and get a chance to look over and see someone's phone who is broadcasting this very presentation to who knows how many people. And it's very easy for us to believe that there is something about these times that are radically different. So I want to pause there for a second and step back to discuss what is it that we are going to be talking about. What are values? What are values? So values are things that can be observed, that we attach an importance to. They are things that guide and shape our actions. Now in English, I'm sorry, I do not speak Malay. Uh, be happy to learn what these words mean in Malay, but ethics and values have two different meanings, even though they're connected. So ethics are the things that guide our behavior. Ethics are the things that allow us to make moral judgments. Ethics are the things that allow us to determine right from wrong, to determine what is acceptable from what is unacceptable. And I want you to keep the definitions of values and ethics in the back of your mind as I'm speaking, because at times I may use them interchangeably but there is an overarching principle that within Islam that unites them together. So if you'll bear with me as I begin to discuss this, because we have a faith. So Monday is the first of Muharram. What year is this on the Islamic calendar? Somebody tell me. So he said this very quietly, but you know, one, four, four, four. So which means that our calendar, the Islamic calendar, starts from the Hijra. And so we have a faith that is over 1400 years old. And there are those who would question why something that is over 1400 years old would have significance in today's society. I often have these same conversations with my Christian friends as a, I'm so happy, my dear brother, that you are here representing uh, uh, your faith and an organization because I get the same questions because according to that calendar, it's over 2000 years old. And you say, well, what does this have to do with today? There are very clear examples from Islam that address the issue that we are facing today. 
There is a period that we often refer to as the golden age of Islam. I was fortunate enough to live in Spain and live in Andalusia. And what most people do not realize is that it was Islam that actually formed Europe. Because before the Moors came out through North Africa and went into what we now call Spain, there were tribal warfare happening within Europe, the Visigoths and the, the various other kingdoms. They were warring with each other. Quite frankly, the only reason they came together was to fight Islam, to put it very simple. But more than Islam forming Europe, it was Islam that was the pinnacle of educational, academic, and scientific achievement. At a time when most of the world did not believe in science, at a time when the world could not do advanced mathematics, at a time when most of the world, quite frankly, had unsafe hygiene practices. Can I just pause there for a second? And please forgive my small digressions, because when I look at Islam, I look at all the things that come together. We were having a brief conversation outside about COVID and about the response to COVID. If you look in the high D's on the Prophet Muhammad, like saying, he told you how to deal with COVID back then, because he said, do not go places where there's this easy task, we're taught to wash our hands. We don't realize how recent these hygiene factors are. This was not a common practice in Europe. It was not even a common practice within the United States to engage in proper hygiene. People took a bath if they were wealthy, they took a bath maybe once a month. This is not a joke, this is true. Whereas Muslims have to wash five times a day for prayers. And then on Juma, you take a whole gusel, you wash everything. And so it pre presents a more scientific approach to dealing with modern problems of germs. And so it was Islam that influenced mathematics because in the absence of algebra, there could be no higher mathematics. As someone who had to study the Roman number system when I was in school, have, have, have all of you seen the Roman number system? Have you seen this number? If you, if you haven't seen it, Google it. You can't do advanced math with Roman numerals. And it was the introduction of algebra as the higher form of mathematics that allowed us to engage in precise computations change the world. Stay with me here. Also, it was Islam that introduced the science of astronomy, because you have to remember that coming out of another era and another faith tradition, they believed that everything rotated around the earth. In fact, Galileo was persecuted by the church because he dared say, that the earth wasn't the center of things. It is not my intent to offend anyone. I'm not trying to make anyone feel uncomfortable by pointing out these facts, but I mention these things because it's an important contextual nature of how Islam influenced the world hundreds of years ago and set us down a path that allowed for the creation of the modern world. All these things that we talk about from the ones and zeros that go into doing computer programming, that's all computer programming is. Ones and zeros, just set up differently, are possible because of numbering systems that come out of Islamic history. The computations, the things that we do, the, the way we navigate, the way planes fly, the way we communicate come out of Islamic history. So I say a lot to say, that we often forget a basic principle of Islam that should inform our ethics and our values. And that principle is Tawheed, oneness of Allah.
And so within the context of oneness of a law, everything that comes out of a law is a unifying factor. The things that we share, the things that we engage in have to go back to Islam. Often in the U.S., you will not hear me use the term the West because that's a geographic thing where West and East is depend upon where you are on the map. So I don't use those terms. So I'll speak about the U.S. because I was born and raised in the United States and I tend to know it pretty well. In the United States, you often have conflicts of what they call personal values or personal ethics versus business values and business ethics as if you were two different people. When you stand before laws upon the one to Allah, he's not going to ask you, well, I'm only going to judge the personal you. <laughs> I'm not going to judge the business you. I'm only going to judge the business you. I'm not going to judge the personal you. When we come back to Tawhi, we understand that all of our behaviors, all of our actions are one. We are one being. How we act in our household, how we interact with our families, how we interact in business is all one. Everything that we do, remember we talked about ethics and values? We have to decide whether our behavior is acceptable, unacceptable by a standard of Tawheed, by the standard of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing else is as important. And so if we understand that our actions, even your mere presence here today is more than your mere presence here today, because we are taught that it is a blessing to engage in these kinds of conversations. It's a barakah. Quite frankly, I get asked by my peers, why do I spend so much time traveling the world talking about Islam and discussing this? I have to confess to you now, let me be clear, I'm not Catholic, I'm not confessing as a Catholic, I'm confessing as in telling the truth that there's a reason why I do this, which is a very selfish reason. Because there's a hadith that you all know that there are things that continue to benefit you after you die. And what is those things? That money that we give in Sakata continues to benefit people, having righteous children that pray for us. And what's that third thing? Sharing knowledge and information that continues to be of use. I'm hoping that something that I say today will be a benefit of you and may help me in the afterlife, inshallah. So if we reach beyond our differences and understand that the differences aren't about us being Malaysian or being from the U.S. or being from uh, Saudi Arabia or anything, it's Islam, the concept of Tawheed, our ethics and our values should be the same regardless of where we come from because they're coming from the one source of all those things. I heard the conversation mentioned by our dear brother earlier about justice in Islam. In the U.S., there is a great focus on individual rights. The individual is paramount in the U.S. This is why you see some of the things that you see about different groups and different behaviors uh, and why it's acceptable, because that's, that's just a U.S. concept. That is not an Islamic value, because Islam values the societal impact of things that are done. The things that are done in Islam are not for the benefit of the individual. It's very clear when I talk to my friends, but I have to live in an area in Oregon called McMinnville, McMinnville, Oregon. McMinnville, Oregon is known for making great wines. It's known for making great wines. And people say, you know, well, well why don't you drink? I said, you can only have a little bit, you know, you're, you're not, it's not gonna hurt you. And, and, and it's, you know, and, and it's not like you're trying to get drunk or anything. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed this in the Quran because what did he say? He said that in this 
are some benefits and there's harm. And the harm outweighs the benefits. There are more problems caused by alcoholism in the United States than all the heroin, all the cocaine, than anything else. And it doesn't say that this thing is a bad thing because there's medical evidence that can lead to drinking some wine could help you with your heart. Can, there's some benefit in these things. But Islamic values are not designed for the individual, even though the individual may have benefit from those values. They're designed to benefit the entire society. Because I also have too many friends that would not be able to take a sip of wine and walk away. They take a sip of wine, next thing you know, they got the whole bottle turned up to their mouth. Fuck the law. You know, it's so, so it's understanding that social impact and social justice trumps individual biases and preference. This is an important concept in understanding Islamic ethics and values. Because the decisions that we make to do business ethically, we cannot engage in businesses that engage in fraud, dishonesty, because even though we may make a greater profit from the money, it is detrimental to society and to the projection of who we are. Let me ask you a question. I don't know about here, so I need you to help me out. Are there used car salesmen in Malaysia? So they're used car salesmen. Well, used car salesmen have a horrible reputation in the United States. Matter of fact, this is, this is how you insult the person. You're acting like a used car salesman. Why? Because I go to buy, you have some cool cars here that I haven't seen in the United States. Like I, I've seen a Pronto and a Vios and I haven't seen these cars in the States, but, but I've seen these cars here. And so you go to buy a car, and what does the used car salesman says? Oh, this is the best car of all time. This car has never been in an accident. This car has never had a recall. The engine is perfect. The brakes are wonderful. And they're not. <laughs> but why are they doing that? Because they want to up the price and make more profit. This is not Islamic. An Islamic approach to that same situation would be to say, here's a car. This car, I've noticed that there were some problems with the brakes. I've tried to fix the brakes on that. I've noticed that there were some issues with the transmission a long time ago as an accident. I'm going to tell you the truth. And then you examine the car and make a difference. Now, what does that do? Theoretically, that may reduce the economic value of the car. But what value is increased when we do that? What value is increased? What do we get more than just the money for doing that? <laughs> Integrity or the barakah? Because we are producing behavior and values and ethics that others want to emulate in while the money that we earn in this lifetime is temporary, the barakah continues on with us, the Yamal Kadeen, that into the day of judgment. I also want to point this out because I just left Bali. And while I was in Bali, I, I, I went into a shop. I'm, I'm here with my, my wife and daughter, and they wanted to get some things from Bali. So I step into a store. Now, this may come as a surprise to some of you, but I am not Indonesian. <laughs> I'm not Malaysian. And so when I show up in the store, I show up as what? An American. Which means that the moment I step into a store, the price goes up on everything. <laughs> the same item. 
that was a hundred dollars or a hundred ringam or a hundred a hundred rupees before I came in is now 150, 200 rupees. This is not Islamic. <laughs> The, the price of the item is the price of the item. Now, let me be clear. I understand we negotiate things, but you don't raise the price because you think somebody could afford to pay more. In fact, there would be a better blessing if someone showed up who you didn't think could pay for that item and you lowered the price. This is observable Islamic ethics and values. It is something that can be seen because we're trying to treat people fairly and honestly. This is the roots of Islam because when the Prophet Muhammad was selected by Khadija, may peace and blessing be upon her, because he was Sadiq, because he was an honest, truthful man, he became her representative as a merchant. Why did she select him? Why do people trust him? Why do we talk about Islam and we even use the word Sunni or Sunnah? Muslims, but we don't follow this example of the prophet. Matter of fact, this was an argument that the prophet used in order to propagate Islam when he came, said, if I come running over the hill and I said to you that there was an army behind me, would you listen to me? And they said, of course. Then why do you doubt me when I come say that there's la ilaha illallah? What are we doing to represent Islam in the modern world so that people should believe us? Because quite frankly, quite frankly, I often have to correct people when they talk about Islamic countries. I say, there are majority Muslim countries, but it does not mean that they're Islamic countries. There are majority Muslim countries. Because the question is, are they living out a life that represents Islamic values in the modern world that everybody should want to represent? We should not be seeking to emulate others, the world, we being Muslims, the Juma, the Jamaat, the world should be seeking to emulate us. I spend my time talking about this all over the world. I was in Pakistan and, and whether, you know, uh, I'm in India or talking about this and everybody's looking at US institutions to set their patterns of behavior. And my question is why? There are great institutions in the U.S. I'm from the U.S., that's fine. But Islam has rich traditions that should be setting the way for the rest of the world to follow, not the Islamic world, not Muslims following those traditions. We have our own unique character. We have a way in which we do things. There's a way in which we represent things. And one of the things that, I, that, that we have to ask, and I heard this conversation earlier that was mentioned about education. Thank you for bringing this up, my dear brother. So I need to tell you this, just a little bit about me personally. I, was, I grew up very poor in inner city Philadelphia. My, my father was Muslim, my mother was Christian. I grew up very poor. My father only got as far as ninth grade. My mother only got as far as 12th grade. I did not come from a wealthy, prestigious family. But my father, introduced me to Islam and introduced me to books and gave me hadiths. And one of the first hadiths that I read that my father gave me as a young man was that a Muslim seeks knowledge even if he has to go as far as China. Now, let me be clear. For those of you who are wondering, I am a Black American, have been all my life. Just want to make sure that you know this. And there are challenges that the Black American community faces. And one of those challenges is lack of education in order to advance. My father, people, I said, how did, how did you get to be president of a university? And I said, because of Islam. Because of my father. And I was fortunate enough to know the men that were referenced here. I studied underneath Ishmael Faruqi when I was part of the Muslim student 
Association that was formed. I knew Dr. Brzezinski. I know these people. They influenced. Dr. Merza has been, been like a father to me. And because they introduced Islamic values and ethics to me, it allowed me to avoid drugs. It allowed me to stay off the street corner. I wasn't joining gangs. It would allow me to live a life that got me speaking to you today, alhamdulillah. And so it is Islam that contributes to the betterment of society. And when we find ourselves faced with things like artificial intelligence, we should not be afraid. Give, give me a countdown when we're about 10 minutes out so I can begin to wrap, okay. We should not be afraid because we are taught, first of all, that, that there is something called the root. There's a soul. Machines don't have souls. You can't program that in. And so intelligence is not the basis of our decisions. It is our values and ethics that form the basis of decisions because machines only respond to data in and data out. They computate. What we refer to as intelligence is computation. Now, there are things that are called learning machines, but they learn what they taught. They have no internal spirit. And so what we have to do in making our decisions about the world and viewing the world is what are the values that drive those decisions? Because everything that can be done should not be done. It is not acceptable. It is not right. What is it that we bring to an understanding of our behavior? There are all sorts of things that are capable of being done with modern technology that are not appropriate. I scroll, I'm, you know, I, I, I am on social media. And so I get to see all the crazy things that are put on social media. And while you can put pictures of you in various stages of undress, while you can put pictures of you consuming alcohol or being at parties, the question is, should you? No one's even asking that question. Should you do this? Not whether you can or can't do it. Of course, in, uh, you know, Islam is Haram, but they're not even exploring. So it's the value that we're asking. How does this move society forward? How does society get better? We have people who look scornfully at our dear sisters because they wear hijab, but find it acceptable to have women that have clothes that leave nothing at all to the imagination. What is the basis of that decision? What are the values that you're using to make that happen? And so it is through knowledge and education, the acquirement of even beyond that, if we look at wisdom, if we look at these things that come from the study of our faith and apply it within a modern context, because the reality of it is there are some things that were not in operation at the time of the Prophet Muhammad so it says, and, and, and I often have these conversations with my, some of my friends who are Salafis, of the Salafi movement. And so we talk about such things as investment. There are proper ways to do this. There's an organization here in Mal uh, Malaysia called Saturna Capital that manages according to Sharia principles. So you can invest and take advantage and get a return on your investment of your money without having to engage in RIBA or other bad behavior. This is very different than banks that are setting up Islamic, so-called so Islamic banking, but they have a small portion of it in Islamic vesting, while the most of it is doing other things that are not permissible. They're doing it to capitalize on the market, not because they're trying to do it for the right thing. What are the values 
that are causing you to make your decision that allow you to move forward because it is those values. I come from the U.S. And, and any of you, I, I know I talked to a couple of you who were students at universities. Anyone went to university here? Okay. So in the U.S., students have to pay for their education often through student loans. And those student loans charge often an exorbitant amount of interest. They charge interest. Consequently, when they graduate with their degree, they have to pay back those loans with their interest. Now, for those of you who like math, I, I love math and science. For those of you who like math, there's something called the rule of 72, which says that how you divide a number into 72 will tell you how often your money will double. So stay with me. There are banks in the United States that are charging 20% interest on loans. Stock for long. They're charging 20% interest on loans. 20 goes into 72, three point something times, which means that every four years, I'll be conservative, every four years, the amount that you owe is doubled unless it's paid off. This is why a law spent went to our system, come out, he declares war on those who do this. This is what's in the Quran. It says we declare war, that this is not acceptable. The word reba, which is often translated as interest, I, I think that's a poor translation from my, my understanding of Arabic. A better translation would be about uh, increase and expected. Uh, it goes beyond just interest. It's, it's undue increase. This is crippling the United States economy. Right now, our president is in a great debate as to whether to forgive these loans or not. Because if I'm paying all my money on interest to pay for schooling, I can't afford to even buy a house or get a car or anything. This is why Islam prohibits these values. It is the answer to the economic situation that we face in our society. Because any situation that requires you to continue to pay this interest or continues to pay on something that's a guaranteed payout, this is unacceptable in Islam. You know, there are various economic structures like Mohaba and various other things where you can get into a partnership with somebody, and if you make money, they make money. This is permissible. But when you're continuing to pay for something, no matter how your financial structure is, this is, this is not good. This is wrong. Or a guaranteed rate of return. This is not permissible in Islam. These are not Islamic values. So, but think about how, if those values were applied within a modern economic context, but this is the problem, is that most of the banking system in the United States is based upon this construct, which theoretically why we should have Islamic banks. Then all I do is ask you to examine is the Islamic bank Islamic? And so, you know, I know of a few cases where they really are, like there's a, there's a bank in Bahrain that it makes sure that it looks at things to make sure that they're applicable within the context of Sharia. And, and let me be clear. I know that we may study from different schools of thought, you know, whether it's Hanafi or Shafi or Maliki or, or any of the various other schools of thought. But even in all those schools of thought, here is something that I'm very clear about, that Islam is about justice. Islam is about social good. Islam is about compassion. Doesn't matter what school of thought you study from, it's about that. And when you look at the behavior, if you look at the values that are taught, if you look at the Akita, the things in which we do that should represent our faith, it should not matter what school of thought we came from. Because going back to the very beginning, it's all a function of Tawheed, it's all a function of the oneness of God. And more than what someone says about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about this? What is the, what benefits society the most? What moves us closer? What advances us as human beings? 
not just what enriches us. I want to begin to wrap up with something very clear. And it's something I touched upon earlier. Being Muslim has multiple benefits. The word Muslim, Islam, Salam, come from the same root, Salam mean, finds peace, it comes from the same root words in Arabic. Multiple benefits. And I love those benefits. You know, a common greeting for us when we talk to somebody, you know, we say, Jazakallah, Kairan, and Barakallah, Feek, Barakallah, Feek, and we, we're, we're, we're wishing blessings. And there are benefits to being Muslims. I want you to think about another aspect of being Muslim. And that's your responsibility. What is your responsibility as a Muslim? The... I, I spoke at the UCM yesterday, and, and a, a number of faculty members uh, attended the lecture that I was talking about business ethics in Islam. And he said something very interesting to me uh, that's relevant to this conversation. And he says, well, we, we came because we saw your name was Miles Davis, and we didn't know if you knew anything about Islam and just wanted to see who you were because you don't have a, a, an, an Islamic name or something. But... That is my secret weapon. Because when I'm talking to people, they don't know. And so I, I listen to them and we're talking about things or we're discussing religion. They, they don't know what I know. And it gives me a chance to engage in dawah. It gives me a chance to engage in conversation. Because all I've ever asked for my doers from Allah is that, you know, of course we say, Rabbi Nateen, for for Hassan, for you know, we wish for the best of this life and the next life. But we also have a responsibility, and all I've ever asked for is that I represent Islam well. So I would say to you, if someone looked at your life, now I did not say your business life, I did not say your personal life. I said if someone looked at your life, would they want to be Muslim? If someone looked at your behavior, would they want to learn more about Islam? If someone looked at what you represent, what your ethics are, would they want to be a part of Islam? If someone watched how you treated your family, would they want to treat their family the way that you do from the Islam perspective? If they came into your business, do they know that you will treat them fairly, that they want to do business with you? This is the other side of being a Muslim. This is why our ethics and our values are important because they are on display to everyone. I'm, I'm going to venture into dangerous territory here because I have the good brother here. And so inside the Bible, it says it is by your faith, not your works, that ye shall be saved. Did I quote that correct? However, in Islam, and even quite frankly, I would argue at the time when that was said, there is no disconnect between your work and your faith. Your faith manifests itself in its works. How you behave is representative of your faith. What values you demonstrate is representative of your faith. This is the responsibility that you have. This is the responsibility that you have. I would like to say in closing that if I've said anything that offended or was inaccurate 
are um, might not have been right. I, I beg your forgiveness. It is truly from from me, and it's from my mind, not my heart. If I've said something that a benefit from you that touch your roof that might make a difference to your thinking in a positive way. Alhamdulillah, he rebel lied to me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Davis, for the very inspiring uh, speech. It touches uh, our heart very closely, alhamdulillah. I think before we invite our guests to uh, present their ideas, their input, let me ask you a very simple question. Uh, how do you see the growth of Islam in the U.S.? Are we going to see the U.S., the, a Muslim U.S. president soon? Uh, the, it's, uh, the United States, uh, it's very clear uh, within its constitution about the separation of church and state. And what that means is that the U.S. has no official religion. Uh, in fact, uh, there are court cases that are going on right now about this matter. Uh, I want to refer you back to a little bit of history. So when President John F. Kennedy ran for president, there were lots of concerns because he was going to be the first Catholic president. And there were those who were concerned that he would answer to the Pope uh, as opposed to answering to the U.S. people. And he assured them his personal religion uh, was not something that was applicable to the United States. And so when you ask this question, so let me be clear. Uh, I, and I do not say this with any sense of uh, arrogance or hubris. To the best of my knowledge, I am the only Muslim president of a non-Islamic university in the United States. And, <laughs> and I say that not because I want to acknowledge myself, it's because I'm Miles Davis, I have credentials, I have things that allow me to be there. And I'm getting to the point about what you're saying about the president. So I think that right now we're in an interesting time in the United States is that there are people who are Muslim who are moving into prominent positions. So the eternal general in the state of Michigan is a Muslim. They just supported a federal judge who was a Muslim. Uh, there, as the Muslim population grows, it's there. But I will tell you, here's, here's the secret. I know you asked a simple question. To the extent that Muslims are more fully integrated into US society, it allows them to move into positions of prominence. Because right now, Islam is primarily painted with a foreign face. It, it, it's painted with, you know, of course, most people don't even realize, you know, I've been posting about the National Mosque here and what's going on here. People are like, there are Muslims in Malaysia? Yes, because all they ever see is the Arab world. That's all they ever know. I have to let people know that there are more Muslims in China than there are in the Arab world. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. So. So to the extent that we begin to integrate and benefit society, as opposed to just benefiting ourselves. You understand what I'm saying here is that we do a lot of things to support just us. But that also was not the, the pattern of the Prophet Muhammad. So he, he impacted everybody. When he went and checked on the Jewish woman that dumped garbage on his head when he walked through the streets, Medina, he, he was, it wasn't about just checking on Muslims. And it changes the world. So our values, coming back to what you asked, I think that as people see our values, cause if I can be political here, and I'm sure somebody will be upset about this, I know people are watching this, and they'll, they'll go tell somebody in the US I said this. Do we really want people like Donald Trump representing the United States? And I say that not because of his politics. I say that because of his character. His character. I mean, it's tough for law. We've got a president who's paying off prostitutes. I mean, come on. Is this what you, is, can we do better than that? So as, and, and even though they want to accuse Barack Obama uh, of being a Muslim, uh, he wasn't, I've had a chance to meet him and his wife. They're not, they're good people. They're good Christian folks, but it's better character. So as we show our character 
and that we are pluralistic, like Malaysia, that we can accommodate people of different faiths, then it will allow for that to happen in the lawful island as to whether there ever be a president. Then. Okay, we invite our friends, our guests to uh, post a comment, a question to our guest of our speaker today. Yes, uh, we have a mic downstairs. Can take from mine. Just introduce your name and then make it uh, short and sweet. Yeah. Thank all of you, and I thank the speaker. My name is Sauharuna. I'm from Senegal. But I'm very surprised with this topic, Islamic values. But in your 45-minute speech, Maybe I'm mistaken. If, if, if I'm wrong, you tell me. But I never hear the word the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For me, I think we cannot talk about Islamic values without sitting and taking a reference to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because it's the picture of our values in Islam. So why I did not hear the word Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Thank you. So, so my, my, my dear brother, I cannot answer why you did not hear, but it was said numerous times. And so, and I referenced several hadiths uh, through the process. So maybe I spoke too quickly or it might have slid past uh, your ears, but I, I see people shaking their heads saying that they, they heard the reference. Uh, I'm very clear that the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Hadith is the commentary on the Quran that provides us an example of how to live. And quite frankly, uh, in my conversation about the importance of education in my life, I referenced the Hadith from the Prophet. So, I'm sorry, my brother, that you did not hear it said, but it was mentioned several times. Yeah. Right, I'll guess. Okay, uh, Prof. Saadia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sharon. And uh, my dear brother, um, Dr. Miles, uh, Davis, I'm very uh, pleased to be here to listen to your lecture. Uh, my name is uh, Satya Muhammad. Um, I've had some experience living in the U.S. for a short while and, and um, have engaged with, with Americans. So it, it reminds me of how receptive and open the, the American society is. Um, I'd like to, and I'm sure you have heard of this, brother, um, of uh, a quotation on observation from a Muslim scholar, Muhammad Abdul, I went to the West and saw Islam, but no Muslims. I go back to the East and saw Muslims, but not Islam. Um, and, and also to a more recent um, empirical study by um, Professor Hossein Askari from George Washington um, University on the Islamicity Index, um, um, a survey of um, Islamic values being adopted by um, I think some 200 over countries, um, Muslim, Islamic, I mean, a majority Muslim countries and, and all, 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 all kinds of countries. And um, the, the ranking that surprised a lot of people. I mean, there's, there's a lot of questions and, and controversy that he created. That the finding is that um, Muslim countries came lower down in, in, in the ranking and that non-Muslim countries, especially the West, um, are higher in the ranking. Um, now, my, my question is, um, you have you have experience with, um, I mean, living in the West and, and in, in the in the religious uh, people, like both Christian and, and, and Islamic values. Now, to what extent do you think this is still true? Um, 
and then to, I mean to me it might be a wake-up call it could be taken positively in the sense that yeah there is a gap that the Muslims have got to uh, you know work on these values uh, but then on the other hand sometimes we want we, we see this to be taken as Muslim bashing and say, you know, I don't have to be Muslim because, you know, you, you know, you're, you're, you're worse off than us. You know, I, we don't claim these to be Islamic values, but these are our values. And so do you think that there's some um, observation as well that Islamic values don't just um, contribute to their personal character, but you can also, and you can see in some societies how Islamic values have influenced and have advanced, have pushed um, those societies um, uh, economically, politically, um, and, 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 and in life and in civilization. Thank you. So that's a two-part question, and I want to make sure I capture both parts. Is, is one is uh, non-Muslim countries adopting Islamic values, and the other part of the question uh, was Oh, character. Okay. The, the opposite of that. I mean, I mean that that's not much um, being cited. Is the good things <laughs> that can come out okay. from uh, Muslim societies. Okay. So one one of the things that I'm very clear of, and I was having this conversation with our, our brother earlier, is that we are not unique in having good values. Uh, there are other people who have good values. Uh, and remember that I said we started off talking about Tawheed. And so all truth that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is consistent. And so whether that person calls himself a Christian or a Jew uh, or a Muslim, you will find similarities of values. Uh, I have found that young people uh, often are more open to living a life of purpose in general uh, about what this so they're trying to push their governments to do the right thing because they've seen the impact of a corrupt way of living they've seen the impact of being driven by pure capitalism or economic gain and how that impacts the family now i will pause there and shift to your conversation about what's happening in non-muslim countries uh, in Muslim countries, is that uh, a lot of the leaders in majority Muslim countries were not educated in those same countries. They were educated at the Sorbonne in France, or they were educated at Harvard in the United States, or Oxford in London. And they go to these institutions and believe that these institutions offer them something better than what they can learn at home. And so they reject uh, uh, Islamic behavior and engage in economic activity that is inconsistent with Islam. And so, uh, so I'm, I'm, I, I'm gonna say this this way, uh, there is a hadith that tells us that a man should be paid before the sweat on his brow is dry. This is what it said. This is not the economic model that is taught in business schools. In fact, yeah, I've talked to some of you here that have MBAs, and we're often taught to delay payments. And they bring these concepts back, and then they're interacting with other institutions that cause them to behave in ways that are inconsistent with Islam, while the non-Muslim countries are thinking about this differently. They're, they're at least willing to critically analyze what is going on. And so we have to think about what we're taking in, and what we're responding to, and who we're trying to emulate, and what it is that we're doing. And so I don't, I don't know whether we call them Islamic. It's, it's really hard to parse out when a society adopts various principles, unless you can get a direct correlation between that person studying Islam and applying it, or whether they've studied their own texts and see the unity in what is being said. Is this making any sense to you, or, or, or Dr. Muhammad? <laughs> is that the issue of attribution? It, it is a matter of attribution. It is also a matter of acculturation and assimilation. 
And so, for instance, if a, a bank president came to Malaysia and studied Islamic finance and went back and started the bank inside of the United States, that's a direct acculturation and assimilation to the ideal and propagate that ideal in the United States. However, when you sit down, and it, and it says this in Quran, it says that there are righteous men among the Christians. So if they are doing what is right, uh, so I've been fortunate enough to study members of different faiths. I wrote, wrote an article that was published where I interviewed people of various faith traditions, including a gentleman by the name of S. Chua Cathy. S. Chua Cathy founded an organization called Chick-fil-A. Uh, Chick-fil-A, uh, some of the best fast food in the United States, but they have about 1,700 stores. Wonderful organization. He was a devout Southern Baptist. Had a time spending to him. Now, there are some things him and I agree, disagreed with, but he was very clear that you treated people fairly, that you paid them a decent wage. He closed his stores on Sundays because he said, I could not be teaching on Sunday school uh, and then be a hypocrite and have my store open. Talk to him, Dr. Mirza, Yaku Mirza, who founded the Amanda Mutual Fund, Islamic Principles. He has an organization. He also owns a poultry farm and a number of other things. He treats people fairly. He pays them a decent wage. He doesn't allow them to be open on Islamic holidays. Talk to, I don't think you have Auntie Annie's pretzels here, or do you? You do have it here? I see something, okay. Amish, talk to her. Amish principles. Treat people fairly. Pay them a decent wage. Demonstrate compassion. And so what I'm saying is that you can look and say that those are Islamic values, but there are also values that are represented within those faiths. So I'm just very cautious to say that this is what Islam is doing to them, as opposed to just wanting a better way, if that makes sense, inshallah. Yes, sir. Assalamualaikum, uh, Dr. Niles. You did mention you did mention hadith in your presentation, but I didn't hear you mentioning any Quran verses in full. Uh, but you did you did mention a, a Quranic reference in answer to the sister just now. So thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, like the previous question. I think the lady school in the United States. I went to school in the states. Uh, four years in Indiana and uh, a year in Oklahoma. And uh, when I was there, the, the, the first thing that really impressed me was that, you know, you have the, the road intersection, the four junction, and many of these roads in the small towns don't have traffic lights. They just have a stop sign. And uh, how the system works is that uh, whoever comes first, they, everybody stops, and then you have to go. I have seen where, you know, you have many cars coming from many directions and everybody stops and they respect the other person and they keep track of who came first and the system works. This, 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 this is values. It, it works on trust and uh, they have it in the United States. Another occasion, uh, I was in Oklahoma and I had to fix a telephone in my, in my, in my apartment and I was married at the time. So you just call the 1-800 number and uh, this lady answered the phone and she was in Cincinnati. Uh, so uh, she asked me, she, you know, she walked me through the thing. And then uh, uh, she asked me, are you married? I said, I said yes. And uh, she said, in that case, you don't have to pay the security deposit. You know, there was a security deposit, 25 bucks or 50 US dollars. So I asked her, how do you know that I am married? I'm in Oklahoma, you in Cincinnati. So, so uh, she said, uh, uh, I take your word for it. So you see, uh, this implies a substantial amount of trust in the society, uh, not from the leadership, the president and all that, but down at the ground level. By the way, Obama bombed Pakistan and he killed over 700 people in the drone attacks, President Obama, whereas uh, Trump did not. But going back to the American society, there are many good things which you have established at the ground level the value system, the ethics, which makes the society function well. My question is, which you, which you, which you mentioned just now, we lack this in the, in the Islamic societies. Yes, we have all the values which you mentioned, 
but why are we not implementing? My question is why? There's a big gap in the why, not in the how. I think we know the how, we know the what, but the why is missing. And this is where uh, people like you need to step up. Can I have your answer? Thank you. Um, so I, I, I cannot, I cannot answer for why anyone does anything other than being responsible for my own behavior. But I will give you, uh, I'll share with you what a sheikh I was studying with while I lived in Oman said to me that I think is relevant to this conversation. And what the sheikh said to me, he says that in the morning, the sun rises in the east and cast the shadow to the west. And in the evening, the sun sets in the west and casts a shadow back to the east. He also said that we in the Muslim world are like the children of rich parents. We have all the wealth and do not hold it of value. He said that you in the West who become Muslim are like the children of poor parents who have discovered wealth and you cherish it. What he was trying to convey, I believe, is that as we get closer to the setting of the sun, the setting or end of times, that the shadow has to be able to be cast back for those who have the information and knowledge and study the religion. A lot of us do not study our religion. Uh, we do not uh, take time to understand its principles. We often engage in debates among ourselves. Uh, in the United States, I've even seen this where instead of there just being a masjid, there's a Pakistani masjid or there's a Syrian masjid. Uh, this is, and that's a cultural organization. That is not the same as an organization for praying. And so I, I, say, I say to you is that that's why I do this not just here, I do it back there. Uh, I. I don't seek this out. Um, uh, after 9-11, I got asked to explain Islam to Christians, and then I got asked to explain Christianity to Muslims. I, I think that we all have a purpose in life, and your purpose is just as important as my purpose, my dear brother, is that, yes, I have a different platform and interact uh, but we are each held accountable for our own behavior, that what is it that we're saying or doing, which is why I said that this is our responsibility, this is our challenge. What are we doing that causes people to want to become involved in the song? What is it that we're leading a life that is worth exemplifying? And we can argue about politics, we can argue about ethnicity, we can argue about nationality, and so, I will give you another reference from the Quran. And, and I don't do it in Arabic because I realize how bad my Arabic it is, so I'll give you my English, which is that Allah SWT said that he created us so that we may know one another, not so that we may despise one another. And that, that, that the creation of differences is a manifestation of this. But what happens is that, and then I'll offer reference what the Prophet said in his last sermon, where he says that to follow the most righteous among you even if he looks like Bilal. Why did he say that? Why did he say that? Why did he point that out? It's because he understands that inside of us that we have our own prejudice and biases. And he made it clear that it doesn't matter what the person looks like, that if they are righteous and doing the right thing, that they should be followed. And so I, I, I humbly accept the challenge to do the best I can, but you are doing amazing things and have the potential to influence the world in a whole different way. And so whether it's in the US or whether it's in Malaysia or Senegal or wherever any of us come from, there's a potential to make that difference, inshallah.
Thank you. Assalamualaikum. My name is Khairuddin. Uh, thank you for your sharing your notion of these uh, Islamic values and your profound examples that you've given. How would you define the other word in your topic, modern modern world? Is it, what would, how, how would a, a Muslim define the word modern? Yeah? You see, we are very... Uh, uh, very consumer society. Yeah? We nearly depleted some of our natural resources. We are polluting the environment. Uh, our system of economics or even politics now are being questioned whether they are sustainable, viable. So what, how we define a future modern world? Thank you. So I think probably a better word is within the present context. So let me be clear about something. And I and I and I said this and and please forgive me if my accent or if I speak too quickly about something that causes you to miss words. The challenges that we're facing are not new challenges. And the stories that are told in, in the Quran or even in the Bible. So when Christ went in to change over the, the, the temple of the money changers, they were engaged in a bad economic behavior by what they were charging people. When Muslims have had to deal with greed, pollution of the environment. This is not a new phenomenon. It, 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 it's, it's, it, from my perspective, the, the ideal that we are somehow moving on a linear thing through time is not a correct perspective. And that perspective is reinforced through the Quran when we are taught that the ink is already dry on the book. And so what, and, and it's reinforced within the concept of talk to our culture that our life is already there. And so we're not moving through this linear, linear place of time is that it's just the, mo the modern times is where we find ourselves now. And so the issues that were being faced in the past are not that radically different than the issues that were faced in the present. They coincide and then what is it that we have to do? So what happens is that our, our application of technology, our application of tools may change, but what are the enduring values that are underneath that, regardless of whether it's this year or 100 years from now or 100 years ago? And so and I use modern within that context uh, of what it is that we're doing. And quite frankly, without getting in too, too, uh, too deep about this, but a lot of things that we're seeing that we're experiencing were also listed in the high beats and the behaviors as, as we talk about skyscrapers and buildings. This, you know, it talks about, you know, people building buildings and that uh, that that slaves will give give birth to their masters. All these things are identified in Quran uh, and in the high deeps already. So it's not a, a linear process. I just use modern because it presents now. Does that make sense to you? Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Prof. Uh, Miles, for the answers, for the responses. Uh, before we conclude, we invite again, Prof, to have a three, four minute, uh, like a concluding remarks uh, to all of us. Yeah. So there's me here. I, I again apologize for anything that I may have said that may not have come across the way that I intended it to come across. I also want to acknowledge how humbled and honored I am to be with people who do this for a living. Uh, what you're doing is for a living. I, I have, as they say, I have a day job. I have a university to run. Uh, this, this, is, this is, you know, a part-time gig as we would say in the United States for me. And the fact that you're doing this uh, on a continual basis uh, is important, that you're publishing books and writing papers and engaging in Dawa. And, and I talked to Brother Jess, who's going to meet with the minister here and, and trying to set up a structure that makes sense. And so I, I am honored uh, to be here with you. I hope that we stay in contact. I hope that when I come back again, we'll be a chance to meet again. And if you ever happen to be uh, in Oregon, uh, I, I invite you to come visit me 
uh, at the university. Uh, and I, I welcome your engagement uh, and questions and also learning from you. I am, I've lived my life. I've, I've been on this planet now for in two weeks for 64 years. I'll be 64 years old in two weeks. And, and I've been here and I know what I know, but I'm also very clear of what I don't know. I'm always open to learning and conversations and understanding your perspectives and what you bring to the table. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. Alberta Law Fikum. Thank you, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, as Prof David said, he was born and raised in Philadelphia. It's a very tough place. We've been there, I studied there. So we know, and to be a successful uh, person, uh, today we are very proud. Uh, of uh, Prof. David's achievement. And we hope you come back to Kuala Lumpur, to Malaysia, and be our your second home or your, your first home, inshallah, soon. So thank you so much. We now um, give the session back to our, uh, our MC. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you for the enlightening and lively discussion. It is hoped that we have benefited from the valuable inputs and will apply the practical solutions in our daily lives. As a token of appreciation, I would like to invite Prof. Dato Dr. Ahmad Fauzan, accompanied by Dr. Ahmad Badri, to deliver a memento to our speaker today. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our program. On behalf of the organizing committee, we extend our deepest gratitude to the distinguished speaker, Dr. Marsh Davis, and everyone who has contributed to the success of today's event. Know that your participation has enriched our discussions and reaffirmed the importance of Islamic values in shaping a brighter future. Inshallah, on this Saturday, IAIS Malaysia, together with the Makassid Institute of Malaysia, will be organizing a special talk on examining contemporary global challenges in Muslim societies and analysis through the lens of the Quranic objectives. This talk will be delivered by Professor Dr. Jassi Auda. It will be held in this very hall, the same time at 10 a.m. until 12 p.m. Thank you once again for your presence and your dedication. May these values continue to guide us on our journey towards a better world. See you again and see you on Saturday, inshallah. With that, I end with Kafaratul Majris and Suratul As. What else in an insan of us in the Ladina Amanuan is not of us? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Please enjoy the pre prepared light refreshments. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>